this works. Okay, thank you, Ed, and thank you very much for the uh, invitation to participate in today's conference. Um, I'm going to give an overview of the Linnean Society Asian collections with I think a lot of people in the audience uh, will be familiar with so apologies to those of you who know um, what I will present and but I hope some of it will be new and uh, I hope it will be of interest to the rest um, of the conference. Um, and I will, you will see that um, a lot of our holdings uh, are related to the uh, Indian subcontinent, but I've also included a few examples of the, of the Far East, uh, and those collections are fewer in our collections, hence the predominance of um, India and, and that whole um, subcontinent. Um, so the Linnean Society uh, was uh, founded in 1788 upon the acquisition of the collections of the Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus, most famous uh, for his uh, systems of classification throughout the 18th century. And today, uh, his main uh, long lasting legacy is the binomial nomenclature. And these were purchased in 17, his collections were purchased in 1784. And they're now in the basement uh, in, a, in a room at the Linnean Society on um, Piccadilly in Burlington House. That collection is made up of quite um, mixed material, um, which you can see the room here in the basement uh, with the books. Um, and these two bays in, in, the, in the room are all of Linnaeus's own work, but there's also all the books from his library. Um, there are also um, some manuscripts, uh, letters uh, with uh, uh, Linnaeus, uh, received letters from more than uh, 600 uh, correspondents in his lifetime. So all of those are there. Uh, and then a, a lot of artwork and uh, specimens. And amongst the specimens are uh, herbarium sheets, uh, fish, some shells, uh, and insects as well. And all of this is, um, is, is there for the researcher, which makes uh, really a treasure trove of interconnected material uh, all of which are related to each other. And that theme of interconnectedness of the material as well as, well as um, methods of transmission of knowledge from naturalist abroad to center of learning like uh, Linnaeus in Uppsala will be a thread, I hope, throughout my presentation. So Linnaeus acquired his material, um, uh, some of it came from his travels, but he only really traveled uh, in continental Europe before going back to Sweden for the rest of his life. Uh, and he really um, relied on uh, letters coming into him with uh, materials such as specimens and descriptions of animals and plants that he didn't know of uh, through his correspondence. And I'm gonna take uh, an example of that correspondence. Uh, one of his correspondents uh, towards the end of his life uh, was John Bradby Blake, um, who worked in China as a resident supercargo of the British East India Company. And he, uh, Blake, sent seeds and local plants to Britain and the American colonies for propagation. Uh, but he also did a lot of recording and studying uh, of these Chinese plants and their place in, in Chinese culture. And he collaborated with a Chinese artist uh, called Mokso Wu, I sorry, apologies if I'm uh, mispronouncing this, to draw a whole corpus of plants and fishes uh, and collected information on these. And, Blake uh, died quite young, he was 27, um, but he had time to amass a whole corpus of work which is now kept at the Oak Spring Foundation. Uh, and there's been a whole uh, project on, on Blake led by uh, Peter Crane at Oak Spring, uh, Jordan Goodman and Joseph Richard. I have to say, I'm gonna drop quite a few names because a lot of what I'm gonna present today is showcasing the research that's been done on our collections by other people um, uh, as, I'm, as uh, Ed said, I'm more of a Linnean uh, scholar when I have time to do research. So all of this is very much dependent on research that is done uh, by other researchers using our collections. Um, and uh, I pointed this manuscript, which is kept in the Linnean manuscript. Uh, so this lychee to uh, Jordan Goodman uh, during the pandemic, and he became very excited uh, and we think that it is very possible that this came from uh, John Bradby Blake to Linnaeus or Linnaeus's son 
uh, towards the mid 1770s. The mid the 1770s are already at the end of towards the end of of Linnaeus's life. So that's just one example of a correspondent uh, sending back material. A lot of the material that was sent back was done so by Linnaeus's students, uh, his favorite students he called his apostles, uh, and he sent them throughout the world uh, to send back or to bring back material to him that could be named, described, and published in his major works, uh, Systema Naturae or Species Pontarum. Um, and as you can see, uh, several of Linnaeus's students did indeed go uh, towards the east, uh, going through the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, and in some cases, uh, Thunberg well, went all the way to Japan and Per Osbeck to uh, China. Um, but I'm gonna take an example of uh, Johann uh, Gerard Koenig, who spent a few years uh, in what was then known as Trankabar um, and uh, is now known as Tarangambadi. Uh, and he sent, there's quite a few specimens of plants in our collections from uh, Koenig, uh, sent by Koenig back to Linnaeus. Uh, this is an example of Indian swamp weed, uh, Ruelia uliginosa, as he then called it. I think it's now called Hygrophila um, polysperma. Uh, and uh, in many cases in the Linnaean collections, it is possible to find the letter which accompanied the specimen or indeed a manuscript which had the description of that specimen. And this is the case here. Uh, this is case. This is kept in a section of the Linnaean manuscript called Miscellaneous Authors, and hence the MA here in uh, the reference number. Uh, and uh, we have a few manuscripts from Koenig. This is the fifth one. And upon inspections, when I, I catalogued this manuscript, it clearly belonged with uh, this particular plant. Um, by uh, 1777, Linnaeus had suffered uh, at least one stroke. Uh, he was not able to, to do much work. So it was published by Linnaeus's son, also called Carl Linnaeus. So we call him Carl Linnaeus Filius or Carl Linnaeus the Younger uh, in his Supplementum Plantarum of 1781. And you see here the name uh, Koenig of the, the collector and its location. Um, so that's uh, Linnaeus and the collections of Linnaeus is, is really important for us. It's really the core of our collection but it's not the only collection that uh, we have. Uh, so that, that uh, the, the collection of our founder, James Edward Smith, kind of came to uh, grow on top of uh, the Linnean collection. Um, so James Edward Smith acquired the Linnean collections in 1784, founded the Linnean Society in 1788 and uh, added his own collections to the corpus. Um, some of these were kept separately, so his herbarium, for example, is kept separately, and as part of his herbarium, there is a collection that was recently, um, well, I say recently, this is 2018, I think, um, uh, rehoused thanks to a grant from the Arts Council, but we still need to catalogue it. It's a very interesting uh, carpological collection, it contains fruits and seeds, it has, for example, tea blossoms uh, from China, um, but it needs a lot of work in terms of its provenance uh, and establishing exactly what's in it. Uh, so these, the herbarium and the carpological collections are kept separately. Uh, the manuscripts are within our archives. Uh, Smith's books are within the library. And Smith himself mixed uh, the insects and the shells that he acquired within Linnaeus's uh, specimens. Um, and uh, like Linnaeus, much of, of his collection came from his network and his correspondence. Um, and many of those became fellows of the Linnaean Society once Smith had founded the Linnaean Society. So in effect, you have like three collections uh, within each other. Uh, the starting point is Linnaeus, Smith then grows that. And then finally, there's the whole corpus of archives, specimens, artworks, uh, manuscripts, etc. Uh, from the fellows of the Linnaean Society. And I've put here some of those fellows um, who were linked uh, mostly to, uh, to India uh, and whose archives uh, we have. And some of these uh, will be mentioned um, in the course of, of the paper. Um, so, so these archives from these fellows are of three sorts, I guess. Um, uh, broadly, they can include uh, gifts that were given to either Smith or the Linnean Society, um, their entire collections, 
or, or their papers that were submitted to be read at meetings. And I'm going to give um, an example of uh, each one of those. So one, one example of an entire collection uh, that ended up at the Linnean Society, uh, and many of you here will have heard of this one uh, before, is that of B uh, Francis Buchanan Hamilton, who was a surgeon naturalist uh, who served on political, <coughs> excuse me, and survey missions, some of them uh, as part of the British East India Company in Bi uh, Burma, Mysore, Bengal, and Nepal. And, uh, Buchanan Hamilton's manuscript and his artwork are now uh, scattered. Um, I meant to double check this, but I'm pretty sure there's some at the British Library. Uh, we have a, a whole set of them, and there are some as well, or copies of the artwork at the Royal Botanical Garden in Edinburgh, and um, uh, Henry Nolte will, will know more about this. Um, when Buchanan Hamilton uh, was a fellow of the Linnean Society, he came back to uh, England on furlough, and he left many of his manuscripts and artworks to Smith uh, so that the latter could publish them. Um, Smith uh, integrated all of the herbarium sheets that were part of Buchanan Hamilton's collection within his own herbarium, which is why I've kind of linked them here. Um, the artwork and the manuscripts are still kept separately in the archives. Uh, and Buchanan Hamilton uh, sort of fell into relative oblivion until recently with researchers like Mark Watson, uh, Henry Nolte, and uh, more recently, uh, the artist Claire Banks, who's, who's studying Francis Buchanan Hamilton's uh, artwork. Uh, and uh, uh, they are incredibly interesting because a bit like Linnaeus, they are interlinked so that the specimen informed the illustrations, which are yet more informed by the manuscripts that are kept with them. So I'm just going to show you a few examples uh, of his um, artwork, mostly, and his material and uh, various uh, um, places where he, he went. So these are two uh, illustration of plans for, from his trip to Mysore in 1800. Um, the Nepal material is particularly um, complete. Uh, and um, uh, here again, we have that interconnectedness of the material where so you can have a specimen, in this case, uh, a species of an orchid collected in October 1802 in Upper Nepal. And uh, that orchid was uh, further illustrated by Buchanan Hamilton's Bengali artist, and I'll come back to, uh, to him later on. Uh, and then documented by uh, Buchanan Hamilton's uh, copious manuscript description in various formats, including uh, kind of small paper slips to give a very brief description of them. And then finally, in some cases, uh, when uh, Smith actually used the material, and that was quite rare, uh, that description and the illustration were used uh, in publications. Here at Smith, uh, Exotic Botany from 1806. Um, so that's an example where we have quite a corpus of, of an ent entire collection in, in many ways. I just want to show you uh, two examples of donation and gifts that were made to the Linnean Society. So one example of a gift, oh, and I should say, I realized, I realized that I, uh, I, I'm supposed to be in the, in the flora section. I do apologize to the organizers for having included some fauna in my talk. I hope um, this is okay. Um, because there's beautiful uh, artwork in the Linnean Society that I couldn't not show. Uh, so please accept my apology from deviating from botany here. Um, so this is an example of a gift given to the Linnean Society. Um, it's a wonderfully preserved little album of birds painted on mica, uh, which is, was donated to the Linnean Society by John Short, uh, who was an Anglo Indian uh, surgeon as part of the British East India Company. And we suspect that this was a gift given uh, just before uh, Short became a fellow of the Linnean Society. So there are 24 gouache paintings uh, of birds of South India. Um, they're remarkably well preserved. Uh, uh, as Henry knows, uh, mica is uh, very uh, fragile or the paint on mica doesn't uh, last very long, so, but these are, are incredibly well preserved. Um, and uh, there are scientific names of them that you can't really see uh, at, the, at the bottom here, uh, added to the mounts. 
Uh, and they were thought to have been produced by an unknown Trisha Nipoli uh, artist around uh, 1859. 20 of them are versions of drawings published as a hand colored lithograph in Thomas Caverhill Jowden's illustration of Indian ornithology. And you have here the plate for Jowden's leaf bird. Uh, and it is thought that, um, that the paintings are more a copy of Jowden's book rather than the other way around. Uh, and I will um, uh, draw your attention to uh, Henry Nolte again, who's done some research on these paintings on mica, which is why uh, we have been able to complete our, our, our catalogue record uh, so thoroughly thanks to his research. Um, and uh, Henry did one of our Linnean Lens events uh, uh, on this particular subject, which you can see online on our YouTube channel. Um, Again, something Henry has worked on uh, for our, our treasures book is uh, these um, plates of Indian insects, which uh, were donated by uh, William Carey. Uh, in, uh, in 1828, the Linnean Society received a packet of 35 watercolor drawings from Bengal. And it was a gift from uh, the Reverend Dr. William Carey, um, who, who was then <coughs> in Bengal. Um, where he spent the, all of his, pretty much all his uh, working life. Um, these are quite remarkable. They're, they're very beautiful. Um, they include 22 plates showing the life cycles of various insects with their host plates, with their host plants, sorry. Uh, and then there's an additional 13 plates that just show uh, numerous species of insect, uh, which I think still need some identification work. So if any of you are interested, you're very welcome to come in and, and help us um, refine our knowledge of that particular uh, collection. So amongst the, uh, the, the plants, there's some crop plants uh, like jute, uh, mustard and, and taro, and they have their associated pests as well. So there's an economic value uh, to, to this as well. So, um, I move now to uh, society papers, which is the third type of collection or archives that we have. Um, many uh, of the archives that we have from Asia are actually papers, often accompanied by illustrations like this one, uh, papers that were submitted to be read at meetings of the society. And so we have the manuscript uh, form that was read uh, and uh, often uh, this was read at a meeting and then if, if it was deemed appropriate and good enough that it was then published in the society's journals, like the transactions of the Linnean Society. So we have, for example, uh, papers sent by Major T General Thomas Hardwick, who was in India from 1777 to 1823 uh, with the British East India Company. And while he was in India, he uh, commissioned and amassed a huge collection of paintings of animals. And we know that he employed local artists uh, to draw them. Uh, but some of these artists were also made by his daughter, Elizabeth. Um, the Indian artists that Hardwick employed are mostly unknown except for one, uh, but they were trained and their style uh, was adapted to the demands of technical illustration using watercolors. Uh, and I know that uh, there are some of his paintings, I believe, um, oh, I'm in to check that, it's either at the NHM or the British Library, and uh, apologies, uh, I know Malini Roy is here and she probably knows. Um, Hardwick uh, sent 22 papers to be read at meetings of the Linnean Society, and many of these were then published in transactions of the Linnean Society. So here we have a description, uh, and I quote the title, Description of a serpent hitherto supposed of the genus Boa, uh, which is in fact a reticulated python. Uh, it was, the paper itself is dated uh, 10th of November, 1821 and was written in Dum Dum. Uh, and the watercolor drawing was prepared from a live specimen in a menagerie and it's dated Calcutta, December, 1821, uh, right at the bottom there. Uh, and it was read at a meeting of the Linnean Society on the 4th of March, which is inscribed here, 1823, uh, and then later published in the transactions. So the naturalists I've so far uh, mentioned were uh, all European white men working in or relating back to centers of knowledge in Uppsala, 
in London, in Paris, or in Calcutta, all hubs of networks within colonial structures. And I think a, a very exciting uh, developing research avenue is uh, to track the source of the knowledge um, at the uh, bottom of the chain of transmission, so to speak, uh, by which I mean the indigenous artists and the collectors who were often the source of the knowledge of plants and animals to the naturalist on the ground. Uh, and these naturalists would then, uh, as we've seen, transmit that knowledge from the periphery to a center and then often to another center like London or, or Paris. Um, and in a few examples, um, it's, been, uh, it's been possible to trace, uh, uh, once again, entirely on the research of others, who the artists or the collectors uh, were. So if we stick with uh, Major General uh, Thomas Hardwick, for example, and we take this paper uh, on the red panda that was sent along with this illustration uh, to the Linnean Society. So it was entitled, Description of a Quadruped, a native of the Himalayan chain between Nepal and the Snowy Mountains. Uh, and dated uh, Calcutta, the 5th of February, 1821. And it was read at a meeting of, of the Linnean Society also in 1821, uh, six months later. Uh, poor Hardwick, uh, for some reason, the Linnean Society sat on this manuscript for ages after the reading of the paper, didn't publish it until much later, which meant that by the time it was published, uh, the Red Panda had been given its scientific name by Cuvier, um, Elurus uh, Fulgens, uh, and therefore, therefore, therefore Hardwick was ro robbed in, in many ways of uh, the um, attribution of the red panda. But as far as we know, this is possibly one of the, possibly the first image of a red panda to arrive in Europe. Uh, Mark Watson, uh, in a paper that will be published, I believe in April in Archives of Natural History, has managed to track from archives in Kolkata uh, that the collector of the pelt of the red panda was Bharat Singh and not Wallach as had been previously thought. Uh, and Bharat Singh sourced it itself from uh, uh, traders and merchants in Kathmandu whom he questioned. Uh, so he went to the source of the traders, the hunters and the merchants. Uh, and uh, Mark has also managed to track down that the pelt is now at the Natural History Museum in London. And I should also mention the work of David Lowther, who has previously uh, published on the Red Panda. Um, similarly, it is known uh, that many of the paintings done for Buchanan Hamilton, who uh, I've mentioned before, were undertaken by uh, the famous Bengali uh, artist Haludar, who worked for the East India Company. Uh, and uh, Haludar, it, it's very probable uh, that uh, he was the artist behind uh, the paintings that were done for Buchanan and Hamilton where ha when Haludar was uh, younger. Again, I refer back to Henry Nolte and Mark Watson who have written uh, on uh, Buchanan and Hamilton, I believe part two of their paper on Buchanan and Hamilton in Archives of Science is uh, underway. Uh, and Claire Banks is currently uh, undertaking a PhD on, on the subject um, of, of the artwork, which I think will shed more light on, on these indigenous, uh, also known as company artists who worked for the East India Company uh, and who, um, who helped really uh, British and European naturalists to communicate their findings to, uh, to other naturalists and scholars in, in Europe. Um, Haludar, of course, featured in this uh, beautiful, wonderful exhibition that took place at the Wallace Collection uh, back in, I think it was 2019 because it closed uh, uh, because of COVID, um, and which was dedicated to uh, the forgotten masters, uh, Indian painters for, uh, who worked for the East India Company. Um, for me, as a head of collection, as, as an archivist, this has a very practical uh, consequence, people who come in to work on our collections, it means that I can uh, uh, reattribute uh, the creator status in our uh, archives catalogs. So you have here the back end of our archive catalog and you can see uh, this is the record for the Mysore plant drawings uh, which are attributed to Buchanan Hamilton as the creator and really uh, the creator should not be uh, Buchanan Hamilton, uh, but Haludar if, if and when 
uh, we managed to ascertain that Haludar did paint them. Uh, and then Francis Buchanan Hamilton can come into the description uh, where it says that um, he was the one who uh, collated that uh, collection together. But certainly I would like as much as possible to see that creator name, especially for our artwork uh, attributed to the, the real creators of, of these uh, uh, wonderful pieces, which are often uh, indigenous and local artists. Um, so I don't know, I think I've gone very, very fast, but um, I just to conclude, uh, there's much more to discover at the Linnean Society. We've got still society papers like this one uh, by William Roxburgh uh, with artwork that is unattributed uh, and we would love to be able to put uh, a name or a, a precise date on, on these um, archives that haven't really been looked at. Um, as I was preparing this, I asked Gina Douglas, who was our librarian and who's a fount of knowledge on our holdings, if she knew of any others. And she started coming up with lots more uh, uh, archives or records in our, our own archives that I, I didn't know of. So, for example, uh, there's an album of drawings and recipes from an English woman called Emma Williams. Uh, she seems to have uh, drawn fruits uh, of, from Assam. There's also an album of drawings from a paleontologist, Count Paul Edmund de Streslewski, uh, who was active in the 19th century and who records his travels in India. So I would uh, encourage anyone who's interested to come to the Linnean Society uh, and undertake some, some research because uh, as I hope I've shown, it is a collaboration between academic research uh, staff and collection staff, as well as collaborations between organizations uh, that really further research and knowledge about naturalists, um, go-betweens, artists and collectors, uh, wherever they may be from. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Isabel, for that wonderful presentation. That was really uh, fascinating and enjoyable. And I think we can certainly forgive you for including the animal drawings, which were very welcome, useful as the plant drawings were. Um, you really covered the gamut of the collections at the Linnaean Society um, and introduced so many things about the, the relationships between knowledge networks and patronage involved in the creation of um, this very complex collection and also the research, ongoing research into the source, um, the sources um, of this knowledge acquisition. Um, and, all, and indeed the overlaps uh, between the collections at the main society and other institutions. And I'm sure that all of those will be themes that are that emerge from, from the other, other talks um, this afternoon. So thank you so much for getting us off to such a wonderful start. Um, I just have one very small question. Um, and of course, I, I, I must reiterate, please do uh, put your questions into the Q&A. Um, I, think, I think that should, um, that should be working. Um, if not, just to say, write in the chat. Uh, but I, I, the William Carey drawing, uh, first of all, was that the Sanskritist William Carey? Was um, that the, sorry? Was that the Sanskrit scholar William Carey? Uh, yes, 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 um, it was. And was it, and was the drawing, but was the artwork by him as well? Um, well, that, I'm not sure. Was done um, Henry might want to come in on this because he's he's actually written for it. We've got a, a treasures book which I have with me here, and it's opened at the page that he's written. Um, but I don't know that we have uh, identified who the artist was. But Henry, do correct me if I'm wrong. They're certainly not by Carey. They're right, by. Like being astonished. <laughs> probably by an Indian artist, right. but the, the insect ones, I think, might be by a Chinese artist, actually. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure we have, I'm not seeing anything in the q and I just want to make sure that that's not because we're having a technical problem. Um, uh, no, as far as I know, it's, uh, it's working, Ed. Uh, okay. Maybe it's fine, absolutely fine, and there's, there's no question. I'm quite happy to take them as they come later on as well. Well, I worry I might have preempted some of the comments or questions in my own very short pressing of your, of, your, of, your, of your talk, but that was really fun, fantastic, and thank you so much, Isabel. Um, thank you. And um, I think we've built in time for a 10-minute break, and we're pretty much on, on schedule, so I think we will 
we'll we will start again in 10 minutes for holly morgan rock's talk nature's empire um, but we do have time for people to to take 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 a break but please do try to be back um for for uh 10 to 2 thank you <laughs>